coal, the most important fuel in use today. Great Britain has the richest coal seams in the world. For me, this is where it all begins, this is where it all starts. My identity is shaped by the coal face, shaped by coal, moulded by its design. What does this mean? What does it mean to be from Bindley? What does it mean to be a Bindley kid? At one time it was a pit village, now it's an estate, a business park, a nature reserve. People always say that the pits are dead, but they're not dead. They're completely alive, alive in the people and alive in the memories that they hold. By looking into the land, the community, the people, I could begin to explore what this identity means. What is this lost identity? Where can I find it? The pitmen are a race apart from other Tynesiders with a way of life of their own. Their conditions, their homes, their washing arrangements differ from pit to pit, but they share a common identity formed by danger, hard work, and an enthusiasm for their own pastimes. Reading books and looking through the archive would only take me so far so I spoke to my step-granddad, who knows all there is to know about being a coal miner. My name is Robert Green. I was a coal miner from the age of 15. I was in the coal mines up until 1994. I'd done 30 years service at uh, Scotland, Michael Colliery, Bowhill Colliery, and then I moved to Dormill in Warwickshire. Uh, well, my family was in mining. My, my father was in mining. And all my friends' fathers were in mining. It was a mining village I was brought up in. And similar to Bindley, but only it was in Cardenden in, in uh, Scotland. Uh, a lot of my mates went to go in the pit. So I, I decided to do the same. I didn't really look for another job anyway. I just wanted to go in that because my brother worked at the same pit. Coal mining really was a job that was based in community. Fathers, sons, friends, all working on the pit head together. And it was unique, and in knowing the industry has there been such collective will. When a pit was born, a village and a way of life was really born with it. It's different now, of course, but why did it all have to end? What caused the closure of so many pits? A lot of the pits, they weren't done enough coal. The seams were different. Scotland and Wales, if you look at the hills in the countryside and the mines are underneath, the seams of coal were up and down the same as the land above them, so it was more difficult to get loads of coal out. Whereas in Coventry area, the coal area, the coal was uh, 12 feet thick that we were taking at Dorm Mill. Every miner has a connection to the land and a connection to the earth. There's a respect that comes with mining, a respect for the mine and for the coal. The work is defined by the earth and determined by the land. In the same way that a fisherman respects the sea and knows its intimacies, so the miner respects the land and all it brings. In two minutes, you are 1,200 feet below the fertile Scottish countryside. Miners live two worlds, the world above and the world below, with both worlds influencing one another in a kind of symbiotic relationship. Yeah, very 
The form of union organization varies, but all unions do much the same job. Besides securing established rates of wages and settled working conditions, most of them strive to take care of those of their members who, through sickness, loss of work, or accident, are deprived of their weekly income. More and more in recent years, the unions have voiced the opinion of their members about the way the work is done, and about how industry can be so managed to serve the interests of everybody. In the coal fields of Britain, production committees discuss how to get more coal from the pits. The National Coal Board, we had two or three strikes because of the wages. We compared their wages to the people working in local Coventry factories, especially the car factories. They were getting more money for doing a night shift than we was for a week's wages. The wages were low, they were far too low anyway, and that didn't help. That was just the Coventry area, but everybody felt the same in Yorkshire and North East and Wales and everything. So we were working for next to nothing. We went on strike for 12 weeks. Well, I don't think we were radical at all, really, but uh, some people got a different uh, idea of that, you know. But uh, the miners all worked with, we were all uh, in the same boat. I've always believed in unions and the strength that unions bring and when I was growing up I just assumed that everyone was in a union. I really couldn't imagine a world in which people working and living together wouldn't stick together just for better pay or better conditions. But being a miner it wasn't just a job, it also defined your hobbies as well. Uh, there was a lot of coal men and uh, coal mates had uh, their own colliery band, you know. Mm. And uh, in Scotland we had, uh, we had the colliery pipe band. We had brass bands in Scotland as well but the uh, Mainly they were bagpipes, you know, play in Scotland. But in England they had uh, loads of brass bands and there were competitions every year between them. You know. Some of them had big bands, others didn't have so many people in them, but they uh, were very popular. Is there something missing when pits shut down? Is his way of life and its values passed on, or is it lost? I spoke to my dad. He grew up in the shadow of the coal mine, and I wanted to ask about his influence on in everyday life and how it influenced the village. My name's Keith Grubb, and I'm 61. I think the mine started around, was it the 1900s or 1910 or something? Mm that all the houses in the village were built for the pit workers. You had to work at the pit to have one of the houses. And the higher you were in the pit, the better house you had. It wasn't just the colliery that provided for the miners. The miners provided for themselves as well. The club that the miners used to own put money towards years ago to get built. And up the top there, it's what you used to call the welfare. There was tennis court, a bowling green, a little paddling pool. That was all to do with the miners. And I remember, I'm sure at least twice, I can remember being a, a big fun affair up there, what the miners would have put on for like an open day or something. When the mine closed, it, it all got let go and uh, the actual building got uh, vandalised. Even back then, it, was, it got vandalised and got knocked down and the tennis courts all got wrecked. It's the perfect example of a community coming together and providing for one another to create better lives, not just for themselves, but for their children and other people. I've always believed in community and in society. The even community that you find in small things like where you socialise or where you go for a drink. 
Well, the Bindley Club, there was a big place. It was a big club at the time. Uh, it used to have lots of members, maybe a 1,000 or so, or maybe 1,500 members at one time, I believe. It was a fairly big club around Coventry. And they had a big, massive new room they built. And they had two snooker tables. It was a fairly big room, fairly big place at, uh, back in the 60s and 70s. A working men's club's always been the microcosm for me of what it means to have community spirit as an important value. Even when growing up, a club for me wasn't somewhere to dance or take a pill. It was somewhere with a snooker table and a fruit machine. When all the children used to go away for the day with a club, coming home, you could probably see the pit uh, heat for at least five or six miles away from Coventry. You could see it off the motorway, and that's when you knew you were coming home. And uh, obviously... Coventry wasn't built up at the time, and uh, you could just see it for a, a fair distance, you really could, off the motorway, coming back from north. The final remains of a colliery is always the heap, so for some I'm sure it's a sore thumb that sticks out of the landscape, a blot on the earth. For everyone in Binley it was something much deeper, it wasn't ugly or horrible, it was home. Just before they took it down or when they were taking it down, you know, you'd go over and you'd just play in it and uh, you'd walk up it and there'd be like steam coming out the side in some places, obviously because of the sulfur and everything else. And it used to smell of like rotten eggs. And uh, you had to be careful where you walked because sometimes it was really hot. If you put your foot in it, you could burn yourself. Yeah, it was a really, it was a really hard. You used to slide down it on a car bonnet and carry uh, car tyres to the top and roll them down and see who could roll the furthest. My dad used to play in the sulphur and ash of the old colliery and as a child I used to play in the same place. Although it's a nature reserve now, you can still see the tracks and the foundations of the building where work, play, exploration have all mixed over the last 60 years. Three different generations of my family, all influenced by this same ground, all defined by its purpose. Actually, on the industrial estate, there are two, the two uh, holes that are there that are capped off of where they had the, uh, the mine shafts. They're still there, if you know where to look. Much like living in the shadow of a mine, this identity seems lost, unless you know where to look. This identity exists, it means community, respecting and connecting to the landscape, listening to the history and the stories, sticking together, building a better life for one another in the communities in which we live. The values have been passed down to me and will continue to be passed down after me. As long as there's people to talk and people to listen, this identity will never be lost. I am from Cole and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs>